Welcome to our channel World Inheritance. In this episode, we will talk about ancient Egyptian families, starting with the Zero Dynasty. Thousands of years ago, in the ancient land of the pharaohs, a great civilization arose that left an indelible mark on the world. In this episode, we will travel through time to discover ancient Egyptian families, from Dynasty Zero. We will see how the ancient Egyptian civilization developed from independent societies to one powerful state, and how it produced some of the greatest achievements in history. The dynasties were Ambos, and in ancient Egypt they called it Nobit, which means gold, and this is a reference to the gold mines nearby in the eastern desert. Nakata is currently Nakata, an Egyptian city in Upper Egypt built on the western bank of the Nile River in Cana Governorate. Nakata is considered one of the oldest cities in all of Egypt dates back to the pre-dynastic era, before c. 2925 BC to 3100 BC. They worshipped the god Set. He was the main deity in Nakata and the surrounding areas from the pre-dynastic eras. The god Set in ancient Egyptian religion was the deity of Upper Egypt. Its capital is Ambos. Its sacred animal is a wild dog. His symbol was strength, intensity, emotions, and thunder. The ancient Egyptians considered him a god of evil and revenge, unlike his brother Osiris, the god of goodness and love. The ancient Egyptian legend says that he was the brother of Osiris and conspired against him, killed him, and took control of his throne, but Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, fought him, defeated him, and regained the throne. The god Set depicted him in the form of a man, and he had the head of a strange animal that is not known. Scientists have divided it into three civilizations extending over about 1,400 years, the first Nakata civilization, the second Nakata civilization, and the third Nakata civilization. Anyone who follows these civilizations notices rapid development between those eras, as the Nakata civilization was famous for its economic, industrial and artistic progress and rapid social and political formation, which led to the emergence of large, advanced emirates in ancient Egypt. This civilization culminated in the formation of unity between northern and southern Egypt with the beginning of the rule of the first dynasty. The most important industries that Nakata was famous for during the Safar dynasty. The Zero Dynasty was an important transitional period in the history of ancient Egypt, as it witnessed the unification of Egypt. During this period, Egypt witnessed significant development in industries, including agriculture. Agriculture was the economic foundation of ancient Egypt. Agriculture witnessed great development during the Zero Dynasty, as new techniques were developed for irrigating land and growing crops. Handicrafts Handicrafts were an important industry in ancient Egypt, and included the manufacture of pottery, weaving, leather, and jewelry. Handicrafts witnessed great development during the Safar dynasty, as new techniques were developed to make these products. As for their dwellings, they were simple and constructed from tree branches covered with clay. Their graves were a shallow oval pit, and the deceased was buried in a squatting position and sometimes wrapped in a goat skin. The Nakata I civilization witnessed the improvement of the manufacture of stone tools and the development of pottery firing techniques. Nakata I pottery is distinguished by its redness and its inscriptions in geometric shapes. With the development of Nakata into the Nakata II civilization around 3500 BC, the manufacture of stone vessels advanced and pottery was mastered, and the ancient Egyptians began to decorate pottery bottles with drawings of humans, animals, and plants. All of the above is called the prehistoric era, that is, before the ancient Egyptians knew how to write. Before the formation of the dynasties, Egypt was divided into Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt was located in the south, and its capital was the city of Thebes. Lower Egypt was located in the north, and its capital was the city of Memphis, now called Memphis. King Menes came to unite Upper and Lower Egypt under his rule, and he took many measures to unify Egypt. Menes carried out many military campaigns against Lower Egypt, and he succeeded in defeating the king of Lower Egypt and annexing Lower Egypt to Upper Egypt under his rule. This event was commemorated by the Narmer Stela, a stone panel depicting Menes uniting the two Egyptian crowns, the crown of Upper Egypt and the crown of Lower Egypt. Menes established a powerful central government in the city of Thenis, which became the new capital of Egypt. This helped strengthen the unity between Upper and Lower Egypt, as the country came under one rule. Menes also appointed government officials throughout the country, 
which helped strengthen the power of the central government. Menes developed Egypt's trade and economy, and this helped bind Upper and Lower Egypt together. Menes built roads and ports, which facilitated trade between the two countries. He also developed agriculture and industry, which led to increased wealth in the country. Menes' efforts succeeded in uniting Upper and Lower Egypt under one rule, which led to the country's stability and prosperity. This unification paved the way for the great developments that ancient Egyptian civilization witnessed in the following centuries. The memory of King Narmer continued thousands of years after his death, and we find that King Lists wrote his name in red ink due to his importance. The founder of the first dynasty is King Menes. King Menes ruled Egypt for 62 years, the first dynasty is the first dynasty of Egyptian kings who ruled Egypt after its unification by King Narmer, and represents the beginning of Egyptian historical times. The center of government at that time was in the city of Thinus. The first dynasty extends from about 3100 BC to about 2890 BC, about 200 years. During this period, Egypt witnessed significant development in all fields, including politics, economics, culture, and construction. The most prominent works of the first dynasty. Establishment of a strong central government in Thinus. Development of agriculture, industry, and trade. Kings of the first dynasty. The first dynasty was ruled by seven kings. King Mina. Horaha. Jur. Din. Aha. Sark. I betrayed. Antiquities dating back to the first dynasty. Many relics dating back to the first dynasty have been found, including inscriptions and hieroglyphs, antique pieces of pottery, porcelain and jewelry, stone and bone tools. Ancient Egyptian history is full of stories and secrets that can only be revealed by ancient artifacts that are found from time to time, because it is difficult for anyone to monitor those details that extend over long centuries, some of which were recorded on the walls of temples in the time of ancient Egyptian writing and others that have not been recorded yet. But it is revealed by archaeological treasures emerging from the ground. Now we will review the most important secrets of the second dynasty, the first king of this dynasty was King Hedabasekamwe. A kneeling granite statue was found of him with the names of three kings written on his shoulder. During his reign, an earth explosion occurred in. On the side of Tel Basta, many people died because of it, and it is possible that an earthquake occurred there due to the location's proximity to the Abu Zabal volcanic area. The second Egyptian dynasty is the last of two dynasties that together constitute the era of the early Egyptian dynasties, ruling from about 2890 to 2686 BC. The seat of government was in Thinus. The order of the names of the kings of the second dynasty is a matter of debate among scholars. There is also a difference between Manathos list and other royal lists that give us the names of nine or ten kings. Below are the names of the kings of the second dynasty, according to their order in Manathos list. Hotepsekemwi. Sada. Kaskemwi. Kaskemwi II. Kaskemwi III. Kaskemwi IV. Kasekemviv. Kasekemvi VI. Case Kemwi 7 and the deeds of the kings of the second dynasty. King Hotep Sekemwi is considered the first king of the second dynasty, and he was famous for building the first funerary temple in Saqqara. As for King Sada, he was famous for building the first royal tomb in Saqqara, consisting of a burial chamber and a reception hall. The second dynasty saw a boom in trade and agriculture, and many new temples and cities were built during this period. The second dynasty was the end of the era of the early Egyptian families, followed by the third dynasty, which witnessed greater prosperity and progress in ancient Egypt. The third dynasty of Egypt is the first dynasty of the Old Kingdom during which the beginnings of ancient Egyptian civilization appeared, as the capital moved to the city of Memphis permanently. It began with King Djoser assuming the throne after his predecessor, King Kaskemwi, the last king of the Second Dynasty. Both the Turin Papyrus and the Abidus King List mention the presence of five kings of the Third Dynasty, while the Saqqara King List mentions only four kings. 
One of the most important monuments of the Third Dynasty is King Djoser's pyramid complex that he built in Saqqara, which includes the pyramid, which is the first tomb to take a pyramidal shape, even if it is incomplete. This group was planned by the king's minister, the famous and influential architect and astronomer Imhotep, who was also known as a doctor and magician. He was canonized after his death until he united with the Greek god of medicine, Asclepius, and a museum was established in the Saqqara area bearing his name. The kings of the Third Dynasty ruled Egypt for about 75 years, ending with the rule of King Huni. King Huni is an ancient Egyptian pharaoh from the Third Dynasty during the Old Kingdom era, which lasted for 24 years. His chronological order as the last pharaoh of the Third Dynasty is fairly certain, but it is not clear under what Greek name Manetho listed it. The kings of the Third Dynasty, Sanakti, Djoser, Sankhet, Kaaba, Huni. It was previously mentioned who built the Pyramid of Djoser? The Pyramid of Djoser, or the Pyramid of Saqqara, is the oldest pyramid in the world, and is located in Saqqara, an ancient city northwest of the ancient city of Memphis. The pyramid was built by King Djoser, the first king of the Third Dynasty in ancient Egypt. The construction of the Pyramid of Djoser was a major achievement in construction technology, and reflects the capabilities of ancient Egypt's engineers and builders. The basic idea behind the pyramid was to create a permanent burial place for King Djoser. It was believed that the pyramid would protect the king's soul in the afterlife. Djoser's pyramid was built using a technique called step construction. The pyramid was built by building terraces on top of each other. Each mastaba was built of polished white limestone, a stone that was readily available in the surrounding area. The engineer who built the Pyramid of Djoser was the engineer Imhotep, who excelled in designing the largest stone building in history, with an estimated height of about 62 meters and six terraces built on top of each other. The base of the pyramid was estimated at 109 meters by 125 meters. The ancient engineer mastered the design of a large trench with a width of 40 meters and a height of 750 meters. Surrounding the Pyramid Fourth Dynasty, from about 2613 to 2496 BC. It was ruled by five kings. Djoser, 2670 to 2620 BC. Sneferu, 2620 to 2589 BC. Khufu, 2589 to 2566 BC. Khafer, 2566 to 2532 BC. Menkor, 2532 to 2503 BC. Shepskaf 2472-2467 BC. Jadafare 2467 to 2465 BC. Most likely, the transition of power from the Third Dynasty to the Fourth Dynasty was peaceful, as Sneferu, King Huni's son from a subsidiary wife, married and founded the Fourth Dynasty. After King Huni died, Sneferu took power. Sneferu. It is the abbreviated name of Ta Senefrui. According to Manetho's history, Sneferu ruled for 26 years, and the Turin papyrus mentioned 24 years. We know a lot about Sneferu's news through the Palermo Stone, including that he built a large number of palaces and temples. Queen Mersank is the mother of Sneferu, and it is likely that she was one of King Huni's secondary wives. Sneferu combined strength and mercy. He ruled and led his country and people to a better life, shaded by security and peace. The economy also revived during his reign thanks to his encouragement to establish trademarks with Phoenicia and he made better use of his country's resources. He sent a naval fleet consisting of 40 ships to bring cedar wood and pine from the port of Byblos in Lebanon, according to what was stated in the Palermo Stone, which are the wood from which the doors and some of the interior parts of the pyramids of King Sneferu were made. These woods are still in good condition until now. It no longer stands in the face of the factors of time for which it was used, such as fixing some stones or supporting them in their places, despite the passage of more than 4,600 years. The Palermo Stone also mentioned news of the construction of 60 ships, each with 16 oars. Military Activity of King Sneferu He was interested in securing the borders, so he launched a campaign to Nubia to restore security and tranquility to Egypt's southern borders. This campaign was mentioned on the second side of the Palermo Stone, 
and through the numbers it becomes clear to us the extent of the resistance that King Sneferu faced there. His army returned with seven million captives and two hundred thousand heads of bulls and sheep. King Senefru gave the name Nasio, meaning the Sudanese, and this name meant all the tribes that live south of the Egyptian border. Sending disciplinary campaigns to the Sinai Bedouins, who were raiding the turquoise and copper mines and merchant caravans. An inscription of him was found on the rocks of Mount Cave, representing King Senefru disciplining prisoners. King Senefru's actions became an example for kings after him to follow, and in one of the texts that was written Anak, nearly a thousand years after his death, one of the kings is proud of his works there and confirms to the following generations that none of the kings who ruled Egypt after him did anything like what King Sneferu did, and he also deserved to be glorified as a god protecting the region alongside the deities Hathor and Sobd. He sent another campaign to Libya and brought from it 11,000 prisoners and 13,000 heads of bulls and sheep. Wealth quickly came with the securing of Egypt's northern borders, including the Sinai Bedouins, the Libyans, and Egypt's southern borders. A major cultural renaissance began in Egypt, and trade exchange between Egypt and its neighbors began to grow. With the state of peace that Egypt witnessed in his era, the effects of cultural progress and innovations appeared in the social life of the people in general, especially in arts, the art of building and architecture witnessed the pinnacle of this progress. Administrative Organization During the Reign of Sneferu He created the position of minister, which appeared for the first time during his reign. There is no stronger evidence than the presence of representatives of the Egyptian regions inscribed on the walls of the Valley Temple in Dasher, which is the oldest inscription of the Egyptian regions ever found. Organizing and managing the work in constructing the king's pyramids in the same place. This huge work used stones estimated at approximately 3,842,000 cubic meters of limestone, while the stones used by King Khufu in building the Great Pyramid were estimated at approximately 2,500,000 cubic meters. As for King Khufu, he is the second king of this family and the builder of the Great Pyramid, which, along with the other pyramids in the Giza region, is considered one of the seven wonders of the world. He is the son of King Sneferu and Queen Hedefir's eye. Then comes King Khafer, and when he assumed the throne of Egypt, his hand was not free to act due to disputes. The internal conflict that arose between him and the children of Defare, however, did not prevent him from erecting a pyramid that rivaled the Pyramid of Khufu in its grandeur and magnificence, even if it was slightly smaller in size. Antiquities also revealed that the number of his children was about 16 individuals, males and females. Khafer was succeeded on the throne of Egypt by Pharaoh Menkor. He remained on the king's throne for more than 20 years, and it is possible that he was Khafer's son. In any case, his father left him the quarrels that arose between him and the Jedefra family. Who is Jedefra? He is an ancient Egyptian king, Pharaoh, in the fourth dynasty. Jedefra is the son and direct successor to the throne of Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid, and his mother is not specifically known. He was the first to link his name with the sun god R.A. Jedefra is considered the third king of the fourth dynasty. He was preceded by Khufu, the second king, and Sneferu, the founder of the fourth dynasty. Jedefra wanted to build a pyramid like the pyramid of his father Khufu in the Abu Ra'ash area, but he did not finish his pyramid except leveling the base of the pyramid. He was succeeded by his son Khafer, who built himself the second pyramid at Giza. Religiously, the fourth dynasty is where we see a real shift in religious practices as sun worship was common, and the position of embalmer was created, and their jobs were limited to preparing the body in private. There were three methods of mummifying the body, one, plaster, the body was wrapped in fine linen and then covered with plaster, and the body's features, including the face, were recreated in plaster, two, linen, the body is wrapped in linen, which is sometimes treated with natron, a mixture of polysodium carbonate and linens are treated with resin so that the contours of the body can be formed, three, flesh, all the flesh is removed and the bones are wrapped in linen. Generally, the organs are removed and then placed in urns that will accompany the body into the grave, and the body is cleaned from the inside. Tombs in the fourth dynasty changed radically. Modest, graves did not please the elites, which meant that they would settle for smaller buildings if the interior was decorated. Hieroglyphs were important to elites because, first, they were a lavish display of wealth, 
and second, because they guided their souls to the afterlife. But the fourth dynasty did not have these writings. Instead, the tomb was deeper and the superstructures were larger. Within the Giza pyramid complex, the tombs of later generations became of a reasonable size. After the Middle Kingdom, members of the royal family abandoned the pyramids, they preferred tombs carved into the living rocks of the mountains of Upper Egypt. The Fifth Dynasty of Egypt The Fifth Dynasty pharaohs ruled for approximately 150 years, from the early 25th century BC until the mid-24th century BC, 2494 to 2345 BC. The Fifth Dynasty is often combined with the Third, Fourth, and Sixth Dynasties under the title of the Old Kingdom of Egypt Kings of the Fifth Dynasty Userkaf, Sahur Nabdi, Neferurkar, Nefer Fra, The Incomplete, Kenkuz III, Shabs Kara, Nyusara, Jedka Ra, Unas, there are pyramids and tombs of most of the pharaohs of the Fifth Dynasty in Abu Sur, al Badrishan including the Pyramid of Sahur and the Pyramid of Nusair, as well as the Temple of the Sun. The kings of that era were forced to share power with many princes and notables of the state, and the administration of the state and its employees expanded. Among them, we found many texts and manuscripts that give an idea about their way of life and beliefs at that time. In the Pyramid of Unas, we find for the first time the so-called Pyramid Texts, which specialize in inherited religious texts and are considered the first religious texts in human history. Instead of being written on the inner walls of the pyramids, these texts were replaced with texts written on papyrus during the era of the Middle Egyptian Kingdom. These manuscripts are called the Coffin Texts, and they changed during the New Kingdom into several books, including the Book of the Afterlife, the Book of Hell, the Book of Doors, and others. In the graves of writers, engineers, doctors, and senior officials who did not belong to the royal family, we found the Book of the Dead. The Greek historian Manetho believed that the rulers of the Fifth Dynasty ruled the country from Elephantine Island, one of the Nile Islands of Egypt, located in the city of Aswan, with an area of about 1,500 meters in length and 500 meters in length. Incidentally, most of its residents are Nubians. It has the Muvenpik Hotel, agricultural areas mostly made of palm trees, the Aswan Museum, and the remains of stone temples from different eras. Why is the island called El Elephantini? The island was known in ancient Egyptian texts as Abu, meaning the elephant, given that this island was an important port for receiving African ivory extracted from elephant tusk. Then it changed in the Greek language to the word elephantine, elephas epsilon lambda phi alpha, meaning elephant ivory, which the island now bears. The island was a focal point on the trade routes to the south of Egypt, as well as the main headquarters for all government, military and commercial missions heading south or returning home. Some also attribute the name to the topography of the island's shape, which is shaped like a ram's horn or an elephant's tusk. Temples of Elephantine Island. Temple of Knum. The oldest construction work on the island took place in late prehistoric times and extended until the early Islamic era, meaning it includes the history of ancient Egypt in all eras, up to the Greco-Roman era. Satit is considered the god of the region, especially the god of floods. Various ruling families built temples to her. The first temple dates back to the first and second dynasties, i.e. around 2800 BC. The second temple dates back to the beginning of the 6th dynasty, i.e. around 2250 BC. The third was built by Sanusrat I around 1950 BC, and the fourth and last was built by Queen Hatshepsut around 1480 BC. There is also the temple of the god, Knum, the stones of which were looted earlier and only the two pillars of the main entrance remain. Near it is a cemetery of rams for the same god. There are also booths to commemorate the rulers of Elephantine, the most important of whom is, Hakka I.B. Additions continue throughout the New Kingdom, and Elephantine continues to play. Its role throughout the late Egyptian eras, where the kings of the 26th dynasty showed great interest in the island and established a Nile gauge on it, and the Nile's flood standards appear on it in Greek and Arabic. It was in use until recently, and after them were the Ptolemaic kings and some Roman emperors, whose names were recorded on the walls of the temples.
On the gate of one of the temple's southern halls appear inscriptions representing Alexander II in the form of an Egyptian king offering sacrifices to various gods, with his name written in hieroglyphs. He sixth dynasty of Egypt is the last dynasty of the old Egyptian kingdom, and its founder is King Teddy. The sixth dynasty ruled for 164 years, from 2345 to 2181 BC. Kings of the sixth dynasty, King Teddy 2323 BC, 2291 BC. King Userker 2291 BC, 2289 BC. King Pepi I, Mir Are. 2289 BC, 2255 BC. King Marenra I 2255 BC, 2246 BC. King Pepi II, Neferker, 2246 BC, 2157 BC. King Marenra II, 2151 BC, 2150 BC. King Teddy is the first pharaoh of the 6th dynasty, and Manetho states that his origin is from Memphis. Teddy turned away from the priests of R.A. and focused on his worshippers, the sacred Ta, in Memphis. It seems that at the end of his life, he was subjected to a conspiracy by members of the royal house that claimed his life. He was succeeded in power by Userker, who did not continue to rule for more than four years. The ancient inscriptions also neglected it, leaving no traces behind it. T.T. did not originate from the royal family. He assumed power due to his marriage to Queen Ibad I, one of the daughters of Pharaoh Unas. Unas was the last ruler of the Fifth Dynasty. Titi and his first wife, Ibut, had a son, Pepi I, who later ascended the throne. Teddy also gave birth to nine daughters whose mother's exact names are not known. The most famous of them are, Seshisht and Atat Hathor, wife of Minister Mararuka, Enti, and Nebhat Anyabak Seshht. Titi built a pyramid for himself in Saqqara. The dimensions of the Pyramid of Teddy are 78.8 meters x 78.8 meters and its height was 52 meters. It is now in ruins, like the pyramids of the queens next to it. King Userker or Wazerker is one of the pharaohs who ruled during the old dynasty in the Old Kingdom era. He assumed power to succeed Pharaoh Teddy, and ruled for a short period, between one and five years. King Pepi I, the third pharaoh during the sixth dynasty. The period of his rule was considered a period of stability and prosperity, and when the rule of the country came to him, he had to appease the priests of the Sun Temple, whose influence was still present, as well as the new priestly power represented by the priests of the god Ta, whose influence began to increase since the beginning of the sixth dynasty during the period of Pharaoh Tet. Therefore, some researchers believe that King Teddy came from the city of Memphis, whose main deity was Ta. Pharaoh Pepi built a pyramid for himself in Saqqara, and erected several temples for himself in Tel Basta and Abydus. Art flourished during his reign, as evidenced by his temple inscriptions, his large copper statue located in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and the collection of alabaster statues in the Brooklyn Museum in New York. It is known from the life history of one of the important figures of this era, Wani, that the king sent some expeditions to Palestine and the south to curb the rebels. Pepi tried to win the affection of some powerful families, so he resorted to the policy of intermarriage, where he married the daughter of the ruler of Abidus, who gave birth to his son, Mrenare, King Merare I 2255 BC, 2246 BC. He was the fourth king of the sixth dynasty of Egypt. He ruled from 2283 BC until 2278 BC. King Pepi II, Neferker, 2246 BC, 2157 BC Pepi II arrived to the throne at the age of six years of age, after the death of Merner I. In general, the period of Pepi II's reign is considered the longest reign of a king in history, about 94 years and science. Egyptologists say that he lived for 64 years, according to the Pyramid of Pepi II. It is the tomb of the Egyptian King Pepi II, located south of Saqqara, northwest of the pharaoh's Mastaba. It was the last complete pyramid complex to be built in ancient Egypt. The complex consists of the main pyramid, the Pyramid of Ka, three queen pyramids, a valley temple, and a funerary temple, linked by a 400-meter-long covered bridge that passes across the desert from the Nile to the pyramid. 
King Maran Ra II is the sixth pharaoh of the sixth Egyptian dynasty. He assumed power to succeed his father, King Pepi II. He ruled for only one year. His name was found near the Pyramid of Neith, believed to be his mother. It was believed that Queen Natakris was the one who succeeded him on the throne and was most likely his wife. Thus, the rule of the Sixth Dynasty ended and left negative effects on Egypt, as the Sixth Dynasty began to weaken at the end of its reign. From the end of King Pepi II's reign, he was a weak and incompetent ruler. His wife, Queen Nefrakare, also had great influence on the government, which led to conflicts between the royal family. As a result, the Sixth Dynasty lost control over the country, which led to an increase in the influence and power of the regional rulers. The Sixth Dynasty lost control over Lower Egypt, which came under the rule of independent rulers. These rulers became completely independent from the central rule in Memphis. They worked to expand their territories and form their own forces. Thus, the Sixth Pharaonic Dynasty ended in 2181 BC, and the period of the first transition began in Egypt. Seventh and Eighth Dynasties The era that followed the Sixth Dynasty until the emergence of the Eleventh Dynasty is considered one of the darkest eras in the history of Egypt, and historians have differed in estimating the length of this era. Some scholars estimated it at approximately 344 years, from the beginning of the Seventh Dynasty to the Eleventh Dynasty, and other scholars estimated it at approximately 315 years from the 7th dynasty to the 10th dynasty. It is apparent that these pharaohs who ruled the country during these two dynasties did not build great buildings like their predecessors at length. The country and its breadth, in fact, we did not find any trace of their inscriptions in the quarries of Sinai and Hammamet. It was the practice during the era of their ancestors that each king who built the great temples engraved his name on the rocks of these regions as a memorial to the expeditions that he sent to cut rare stones for his buildings and eternal tombs, and the names of the kings of the 7th and 8th dynasties together. Netjar Ka'are, from Ker, Neferker, Neferker II, and other kings of the 9th and 10th dynasties. Pharaoh Kedi founded the 9th dynasty, the Greeks called him Akthos and he was described as a mighty tyrant, and he was killed by the fangs of a river crocodile. Other than this pharaoh, that family included three other kings, the first of whom is still the name is unknown, and the second is called Neferker. He was mentioned in the inscriptions of the tomb of Anctify, while the third is Kadi II. It seems that this family has extended over many generations, according to what the genealogy of major contemporary statesmen, 2130 to 2090, shows us. B.C. The 9th and 10th dynasties left a number of monuments throughout Egypt. Among the most famous antiquities belonging to these families are the Temple of Mary Ibra in the city of Heracleopolis, Temple of Sinusrit III in Heliopolis, Temple of Amenemhat III in Dendera, Temple of Sinusrit for in the city of Edfu the 9th and 10th dynasties are an important period in the history of ancient Egypt. These families were a transitional period between the end of the Old Kingdom and the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. The 11th dynasty ruled from 2134 to 1991 BC, the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. It is a family from Thebes, and they made it the capital of the state. The founder of this family was Antef, and he was a firm king who worked to revive the country. He was followed by his son, Antef II, then Antef III, Mentohotep II, and the restoration of national unity. He was followed by his son Mentohetep I, Mentohetep II. He was one of the most important kings of this dynasty. He succeeded in restoring national unity after it had suffered from disintegration and failure. He was called the unifier of the two lands. His victory over his opponents and the unification of all of Egypt under his authority was the beginning of a new phase in the history of ancient Egypt. The period of his reign was an era of stability, tranquility, and renaissance. He was followed by Mentohotep III, then Mentohotep IV and V II. He was the last king of this dynasty, and his minister was Amenemhat, who founded the Twelfth Dynasty. The most important work of the Eleventh Dynasty was that it worked to unite the country again, after it had been divided. But it did not reach this complete unification as the rulers of the regions were contesting its authority, and matters remained unstable. Perhaps her reign was a prelude to the Twelfth Dynasty, during which the restoration of national unity was established. Twenty-one 
12th Dynasty, Amenemhat Dynasty, 1991-1778 BC. The Amenemhat family is one of the greatest and most respected families in the history of ancient Egypt. It was founded by Amenemhat I. He was, as we mentioned, a self-made man who emerged from the ranks of the people. His talents and wisdom led him to the position of minister during the reign of Mentuhotep V, and he assumed the throne after the latter's death. The family of Amenemhat in general is distinguished by the fact that it descended slightly from the sacred authority that was held by the kings of the Old Kingdom. It approached the people by establishing beacons of justice, and by many reforms and economic and urban works that increased the prosperity of the people, and this aspect was evident in the history of Amenemhat I, II and III. Another advantage of this family is that it eliminated feudal rule in the regions and made its governors workers subject to the authority of the king, after they had been quasi-independent kings since the late Old Kingdom. During the reign of the Amenemhat dynasty, that is, over a period of approximately 200 years, the country made great progress in various aspects. This era is known to archaeologists as the era of literature because it reached its greatest glory. Poetry and prose reached their peak in terms of durability and quality, the art of excavation and architecture advanced to a degree that draws attention, and artistic artifacts surpassed their counterparts in ancient times. The country's wealth increased greatly due to the government's interest in controlling the Nile, its establishment of irrigation projects in Fayum, and its reclamation of vast regions of agricultural land, which brought great good to the country. During her reign, Egypt was the most powerful country in the Near East. Amenemhat I. His mother was of Nubian origin, and he was a just, benevolent, wise and firm king. He restored security, order and tranquility to the country, organized its internal affairs, and endeared himself to the people with his urban works. He took care of the Fayum region to organize irrigation and benefit from Lake Morris, Lake Karen, although he was credited with implementing projects irrigation in Fayum goes back to Amenemhat III. He exerted his efforts in exploiting mines and quarries, facilitating means of trade, and putting an end to Bedouin raids on the eastern and western borders. He built a series of fortifications in both of them, moved the capital of the country to close to Memphis, annexed Nubia to Egypt, and subjugated the governors of the regions and took them with firmness and wisdom, keeping among them the most loyal to him and following his orders. With this rational policy, he was able to make them his assistants and helpers, and when he reached old age, he joined him with them. His son, Sanusrit, managed state affairs, and he ruled the country for about thirty years. He was assigned the leadership of the army, then he succeeded in purifying the country and weakening the strength of the rulers of the regional princes who were making the utmost effort in defending the independence of their regions and preserving their authority. Amenemhat laid the foundation stone in building this new renaissance, and paved the way for his successors after him to carry it to the furthest goals. His Highness, and recorded the history of Egypt on sheets of gold. However, the man's work did not stop at the agricultural and administrative reform we mentioned. He was the first to think about creating that reservoir, which was completed during the reign of Amenemhat III, and historians in the Greek era called it Lake Maurice. It is Lake Karen now. Amenemhat I died in 1961 BC. Sanusrit I was the son of King Amenemhat I. His mother was a princess named Nefertinen. His main wife was named Neferu III, Sanusrit, which means the man with strength, and he was the second king of the 12th dynasty. He ruled Egypt from 1971 to 1926 BC and was one of the most powerful kings of this dynasty. He participated in ruling Egypt with his father, King Amenemhat I, during the years 1975 to 1965 BC. He became the sole ruler of Egypt after the death of his father, and his rule extended to 43 years, during which life flourished in Egypt. He included his son in power during the last three years of his rule, from 1932 to 1930 BC, who became Amenemhat II. He continued his father's offensive expansionist policies in Nubia, and established Egypt's official southern border near the Second Cataract, where he placed a defensive garrison and erected a victory plaque on it. He also organized an expedition to the oases of the Western Sahara. He established diplomatic relations with some city rulers in Syria and the Canaanite lands. His rule witnessed stability and development in many areas. The levels of literature and industry were at their peak. This period was also characterized by the prosperity of mineral wealth, the extraction of gold, and the spread of fine gold jewelry in abundance. 
This is in addition to the great effort that was made in procuring the precious stones, turquoise and copper needed to make the jewelry and what is required for sculpture work. One of the results of this period was the establishment of his pyramid and his funerary temple in Lisht near Fayum, which is the new capital established by the 12th dynasty after leaving Thebes, and many statues of him were found there. The first works of Sanusrit, Ein Shams University. The ancient city of An, now Ein Shams, was the country's intellectual and religious capital. Plato came to it to learn from its sciences and philosophy, and to transmit its sciences. Ein Shams Temple. He built a temple for himself in the city of Heliopolis, which was identified through a papyrus written about 500 years after his time. It contains the inscriptions that he presented as a memorial to the great celebration he held upon completing the Temple of the Sun. These inscriptions were initially engraved on a plaque placed in the courtyard of the temple and then moved by the writer. On a papyrus, there is the text of what remains of it. Sanusrat I, and I will now do something, which is to erect a great temple to my father, the sun god, and I will make it as luminous as he made me victorious, and I will provide his table with food on earth, and I will build this house of mine on the holy land, and thus my goodness will be remembered in this temple, and my name will be immortalized on the Ein Shams obelisk. One of his most important constructions is his obelisk, which is still standing in its original location in the Mataria area, the oldest of the five obelisks that are still standing in its original place. As for the rest of the pharaoh's obelisks, they were transported to the capitals of European cities and America. His obelisk is 66 feet high and is a single block of red granite. A line of hieroglyphic inscriptions is engraved on each of its sides, indicating that its resident is Sanusrat I and that he made it as a memorial on the Feast of Sid. Pyramid of Sanusrat I The pyramid is 61.25 meters high. The slope of the four faces is 49 degrees 24 minutes. The pyramid used a construction method that was unprecedented in the history of Egyptian pyramid construction. This new method of construction was inefficient so the completed pyramid had stability problems. The entrance to the pyramid is in the area of the pyramid at its foot. When the pyramid was found, the passage that leads to the burial chamber was blocked by large pieces of granite. The pyramid is surrounded by a great wall decorated with panels engraved with the name of King Sanusrat I. Close to this pyramid, the high priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep, erected a tomb for him, and it indicates the apparent circumstances indicate that he was the one who supervised the construction of this pyramid. King Amenemhat II's father was King Sanusrat I, and he participated in his father's last rule for three years from 1932 to 1930 BC. His reign extended for at least 32 years, as he included his son, King Sanusrat II, in power during the 32nd year of his reign. This was early 1901 BC. The exact end of his reign is not known. He was not like his father or grandfather in his military or architectural activities. The internal situation was reassuring and prosperous thanks to the efforts of those who preceded him. He also had friendly relations and affection with the princes of Syria, Palestine, and others. There is a group of funerary buildings for this king in Dasher, and the funerary temple was largely destroyed, and among its ruins there are carved limestone stones, some of which had the name of King Amenemhat II on them, and inside its outer wall we find the burial place of his wife and the burials of four princesses. Sanusrat II, who succeeded his father, King Amenemhat II and participated in the government with him during his last years. And who built his pyramid in Lahan? What distinguishes Sanusrat II most is his great interest in the Fayum Oasis region. He began building a huge irrigation system starting from Bar Yusef, which is the canal that connects the Fayum governorate with water from the Nile River and ends in Lake Morris, Lake Karen today, by constructing barrages. In the Lahaun area, a network of canals was added to drain irrigation water. The goal of that project was to increase the area of agricultural land in that region. Sanusrat II emphasized the importance of this project by moving the royal tombs from the Dasher area to the Lahan area, on whose land he built his pyramid. This region remained the political capital of the country during the 12th and 13th dynasties of Egypt. King Sanusrat II also founded the first known city for workers adjacent to the city of Lahan. The city of Lahan was called Sanusrat Hotep in ancient Egypt. Sanusrat II maintained good relations with many Egyptian provincial rulers who were almost at the same level of wealth as the king, in contrast to the policies of his successor Sanusrat III. There are wall drawings in the tomb of a regional ruler called Knumhotep II in the Beni Hassan region, attesting to the work he accomplished in his sixth year. Sanusrat III was one of the fifth pharaohs of the 12th dynasty. 
he was the great conqueror. The period of his rule exceeded thirty-eight years, and his reign was distinguished by his complete elimination of the influence of the regional rulers and the feudal system, and then by his military actions in Nubia, Palestine, and Syria. Since becoming king, he had worked to permanently annex Nubia to Egypt, so he paved a path for his fleet between the rocks. The first waterfall, and its engineers created this waterway in the most difficult areas of the granite waterfall, for a distance of 260 feet, a width of 34 feet, and a depth of 26 feet. It carried several campaigns against Nubia in which Egyptian authority was consolidated. His most important work is the Sinusrit III Canal, which connects the Nile to the Red Sea. It is called the Sesostris Canal. This canal was dug in the east of the delta, and through it the Nile was connected to the Gulf of Suez via Wadi Tumilat and the Bitter Lakes. It is considered the oldest water route connecting the Nile to the Red Sea, and this is the first experience to connect the White Sea, the Mediterranean in the Red Sea via the Nile. During the reign of Sinusrit III, the Egyptians invaded the Levant, and he accompanied his commander, Sebeku, in this invasion, where he defeated the Asians. From that day, the authority of Egypt reached these regions, and it exercised sovereignty over the Phoenician coast, Palestine, and a large part of Syria. Amenemhat III. He is the son of Sinusrit III, the greatest king of the family, and one of the greatest kings in the history of ancient Egypt. Among his important works were the great irrigation projects that he implemented, which brought prosperity and well-being to the country. He loved the people of all classes, and when he became king, he expanded the scope of the mines in Sinai to extract their treasures. His efforts were devoted to various aspects of construction and reconstruction, so he sent several expeditions to Sinai to extract minerals from it. His most important works are irrigation and urbanization works. Amenemhat III was the king of Egypt most interested in irrigation affairs and controlling the waters of the Nile, especially the Fayum projects. Thinking about these projects began during the reign of Amenemhat I, but their implementation was at the hands of Amenemhat III. He created a Nile gauge in Samna, in Nubia, at the second cataract, to record the height of the Nile and to check on the state of the flood. News of the measurements of this gauge was sent to the employees of the minister's office in Lower Egypt, and they estimated the amount of grain that could be produced in the light of this data in the coming year. Lake Morris Reservoir He created a water dam with openings on Lake Morris, located in the northwestern part of the Fayum region, to use the lake as a reservoir to protect the country from high floods and to take water from it to improve navigation and to irrigate the lands of Lower Egypt. Before the rule of the royal dynasties, the Nile flood would flood the Fayum region, turning it into a large lake. When the kings of the Twelfth Dynasty came, they realized how to store a large amount of water in that lake and drain it at the time of fires, and Amenemhat III built the Labyrinth Palace. He was succeeded on the throne by his son, Amenemhat IV. He was not like his predecessors in energy and competence, and he ruled for about nine years. Queen Sobenferu The last king of this family was Queen Sobenferu, daughter of Amenemhat III. She ruled for about three years, and then the line of this family was cut off. The Thirteenth Dynasty of Ancient Egypt is often combined with the families of the Middle Kingdom, but some writers prefer to separate it from these families and attach it to the families of the Second Intermediate Period. We find that this family continued to rule from approximately 1803 BC until about 1649 BC, that is, for a period of 154 years, Sekemra Kodawisi Bekatep is likely to have been the first to rule Egypt at the beginning of the Third Dynasty. The Thirteenth Dynasty is considered a direct extension of the Twelfth Dynasty that preceded it, as it is believed that the first to rule it was the son of King Amenmehat for the kings of this dynasty were about seventy kings, and the part related to the kings of this dynasty was lost from the most important sources, which is the Turin Papyrus. What has reached us are torn pieces containing the kings of the first part of this dynasty. The power of the Thirteenth Dynasty gradually diminished over the 150 years of its existence in power. It ended with the invasion of Memphis by the Hyksos rulers in 1650 BC. The era of this dynasty is usually described in later texts as an era of turmoil and chaos. However, this era may have been calmer than previously thought, as the central government in Ithtai near Fayum continued to hold together during most of the period of this dynasty and the country remained in relative stability. However, the era of this dynasty was undoubtedly characterized as an era of decline, as the number of its kings was large, with short reigns, and they left behind only a small number of traces indicating them.
it is clear that they were not of a single lineage, and some of them were descended from the common people. Unfortunately, it is difficult to determine the true chronology of this family in light of the scarcity of antiquities dating from this period. Many of the names of their kings were identified only through fragments of incomplete inscriptions or through scarabs. And some of the names of the kings of the 13th dynasty, Sobkotep I, II, III, IV, Dagger Userkaf, King Antef IV and V, King Hetpeep RA, and many other kings. The 14th dynasty of Egypt is a dynasty of pharaohs that ruled over the Nile Delta region of Egypt during the Second Intermediate Period, and its capital was most likely Avarice. The 14th dynasty existed at the same time as the 13th dynasty in Memphis at the beginning of this era. The Hyksos invasion of Egypt began from the 13th dynasty until the 17th dynasty, and therefore these dynasties did not have many traces that indicate the period of their rule, as Manehan mentions a number huge size for these kings and mentions the duration of their rule for a large number of years. It is also likely that these kings did not enjoy significant influence outside the borders of their territory, and the 13th dynasty was deteriorating, as was the 4th dynasty, which led to the decline of their power which ultimately led to Egypt's submission to foreign rulers known as the Hyksos. The 14th dynasty ruled during the period from 1649 to 1582 BC, and its most prominent kings were. Nihisi, 1649 to 1639 BC He was the first king of the 14th dynasty, and ruled for 10 years. Kadiare, 1639 to 1626 BC He ruled for 13 years and built a temple to the god Ammonius in Avarice. Nepfeo R.A., 1626-1600 B.C. He ruled for 26 years and built a temple to the god Min in Avarice. Siabir, 1600-1582 B.C. He ruled for 18 years and built a temple to the goddess Sekhmet in Avarice. The 14th dynasty fell in 1582 B.C. Fifteenth Dynasty the 15th dynasty, the first Hyksosian dynasty in Egypt, ruled from Ichtai without controlling Upper Egypt. Rather, they preferred to remain in the northeast of Egypt, close to where they infiltrated Egypt. It was founded by King Salitus and ruled from Avarice for about 100 years, from 1650 to 1550. BC. The 15th dynasty was ruled by 14 kings, the most prominent of whom were Salitus, 1650-1645 BC She was the first queen to rule Egypt, and she ruled for five years. Chion, 1645-1630 BC He ruled for fifteen years and built a temple to the god Ammonius in Avarice. Khafer II, 1630-1600 BC He ruled for thirty years and built a temple to the god Min in Avarice. Tepuk, 1600-1595 BC He ruled for five years and built a temple to the goddess Sekhmet in Avarice. The founder of the 16th dynasty was King Senebke, who ruled from Thebes in Upper Egypt in 1649 BC. Senebke was an Egyptian prince from Thebes who led a revolt against Hyksos rule in the Nile Delta. Senebke was able to defeat the Hyksos and establish the 16th dynasty in Upper Egypt. Senebke was a powerful king, and he carried out many reforms in Egypt. He rebuilt ancient Egyptian temples and strengthened Egyptian military power. Senebke also restored diplomatic relations with Egypt's neighboring countries. Sunbai ruled for only seven years, but left an important legacy. He was the founder of the 16th dynasty, and led Egypt during a crucial period in its history. Senebke was the son of King Sokotep III of the 13th dynasty. Senebke was married to Queen Nefertiti, and had a son named Sokotep IV. The remains of the tomb of Senebke were found in Thebes, and have been restored and displayed in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The kings of the 16th dynasty were indigenous Egyptians, and were struggling to reunite Egypt and expel the Hyksos. The most prominent king of the 16th dynasty was Senebke, 1649-1642 BC founder of the 16th dynasty, and led a revolt against the rule of the Hyksos, Sobkotep IV, 1642-1625 BC son of King Senebke, and continued to fight against the Hyksos, Sobkhotep V. 1625-1608 BC he built a temple to the god Ammonius in Thebes, Sokotep 7, 1592-1582 BC the last ruler of the 16th dynasty, and the dynasty fell during his reign.
The 17th dynasty of Egypt is the last dynasty of the Second Intermediate Period of Middle Kingdom Egypt in Ancient Egypt. It was founded by King Rahatep and ruled for 32 years, from 1582 to 1550 BC. Its rulers were mainly contemporaries of the Hyksos from the 15th dynasty and successors to the 16th dynasty, which was also based in Thebes. The founder of the 17th dynasty was King Rahatep I, who ruled from Thebes in Upper Egypt from 1582 to 1550 BC. Rahatep I was an Egyptian prince from Thebes who led a revolt against Hyksos rule in the Nile Delta. Rahatep I was able to defeat the Hyksos and establish the 17th dynasty in Upper Egypt. The Most Important Works the most important actions of the 17th dynasty were the expulsion of the Hyksos from Egypt and the revival of the original Egyptian dynasty. The kings of the 17th dynasty were able to defeat the Hyksos in the Battle of Megiddo in 1550 BC, and restore Egyptian control over the entire country. The kings of the 17th dynasty also carried out many reforms in Egypt, including reconstructing ancient Egyptian temples, strengthening Egyptian military power, Restoring diplomatic relations with Egypt's neighboring countries. Names of kings. The 17th dynasty was ruled by seven kings, the most prominent of whom were Rahatep I, 1582-1550 BC founder of the 17th dynasty, expelled the Hyksos from Egypt. Second Enra I, 1550-1545 BC son of King Rahatep I, he continued the fight against the Hyksos. Amos I, a 1545-1525 BC son of King Sekinenra I, he managed to expel the Hyksos from Egypt permanently. Amos Nefertari, 1525-1504 BC wife of King Amos I, and played an important role in expelling the Hyksos. The 17th dynasty is considered an important period in the history of ancient Egypt, as it was the beginning of the modern period. The 17th dynasty overthrew the Hyksos and established a native Egyptian dynasty that lasted for 500 years. The 18th dynasty was founded by Amos I. He was a king of ancient Egypt and the founder of the 18th dynasty. He was a member of the royal family of Thebes, the son of King Sekinenra and brother of the last king of the 17th dynasty, King Kamos. During the reign of his father or grandfather, Thebes rebelled against the Hyksos, the rulers of Lower Egypt. When he was seven years old, his father was killed, and at about ten when his brother died of unknown causes, and he ruled for only three years. Amos I assumed the throne after the death of his brother Kamos, the last ruler of the 17th dynasty. Amos ended the campaign against the Hyksos rulers in order to expel them. His reign marks the end of Egypt's second intermediate period and the beginning of the new kingdom of Egypt. Queen Amos Nefertari, wife of Amos, was the most revered woman in Egyptian history and the grandmother of the 18th dynasty, which was canonized after her death. Amos was succeeded by his son Amenhotep I, whose reign was characterized by relative calm. The 18th dynasty of Egypt is the first dynasty of the new Egyptian kingdom, and it is the period in which ancient Egypt reached the height of its power. The 18th dynasty ruled from about 1549 1550 to 1292 BC. This dynasty is also known as the Thutmeside dynasty after the four pharaohs who were named Thutmosa. Amenhotep I likely did not leave a male heir, and the next pharaoh, Thutmosa I, appears to have been related to the royal family through marriage. During his reign, the borders of the Egyptian empire reached their greatest extent, extending to Karchemish in the north on the Euphrates River and all the way to Korges in the south beyond the fourth cataract of the Nile River. Thutmosa I was succeeded by Thutmosa II and his queen Hatshepsut, daughter of Thutmosa I. Hatshepsut became the ruling pharaoh and ruled for more than twenty years after the death of her husband and the end of her regency over her minor stepson, who later became pharaoh under the name Thutmosa III. Thutmosa III, who was later known as the greatest military pharaoh of all time, ruled for a long time after he became pharaoh. He ruled for a second term in his old age with his son, Amenhotep II. Amenhotep II was succeeded by Thutmosa IV, after whom his son Amenhotep III ruled, whose reign is seen as the most important stage in the history of this dynasty. The reign of Amenhotep III represented a period of unprecedented prosperity, artistic prowess, and world power, as attested by the more than 250 statues, more than any other pharaoh, and 200 large stone scarabs discovered throughout Syria into Nubia. Amenhotep III undertook large-scale construction projects. Amenhotep III's wife was the great royal wife Tai, 
for whom an artificial lake was built, as described on eleven scarabs. Kings of the 18th dynasty, Amos I, Amenhotep I, II, III and IV Amenhotep IV nicknamed Akhenaten, Thutmose I, II, III and IV, Hatshepsut, Smenker, Tutankhamun and others. More than fifteen kings of this family were discovered, most notably Amos, the founder of the family, and Thutmose III. Founder of the first and largest Egyptian empire in history, the 18th dynasty continued to rule the country for more than 250 years. The family made many conquests, and the great architecture and construction movement that the country witnessed in that historical era appeared. In addition to a vast restoration movement undertaken by Queen Hatshepsut, in rebuilding the country after the destruction carried out by the Hyksos, the large construction movement continued in Egypt with the rule of the 19th dynasty, especially during the reign of King Ramesses II. The rulers of that dynasty were interested in building huge temples, especially after the rule of Tuthmosis III and the movement of great conquests, which caused the entry into huge sums of money as a result of the taxes they collected. Many of the family's pharaohs were buried in the tombs of the Valley of the Kings in Thebes. The last pharaoh of the 18th Egyptian dynasty in ancient Egypt was Hormheb. King Hormheb left military matters to Ramesses I. Ramesses I was a deputy to the army during the reign of King Hormheb, wait for us in the next episode with the rest of the ancient Egyptian families. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the bell button.